that we have two very important events during this closing ceremony. One is the Air Surprise, and we'll come back to it very soon. And the other event is the presentation of next year Congress in Bolzano. But uh, first of all, uh, I want to come back to this very special event and uh, just to tell you that we are very proud to have been able to organize it in very difficult times of pandemics and uh, we have to have very innovative and I'm also very proud to say that uh, um, it's a gender balanced congress because we are uh, more than 54% of female presenters and more female attendees than male ones. So for us, that's very important. There is something new and in the future, I will refuse any explanation of any organizer saying to me it's impossible to find women to speak because we find great female speakers and great attendees as well. Okay. So just to see that uh, I want to thank you all about uh, this uh, Congress. Of course, to thank all the participants who have attended to this uh, very special event during three days, you have been a lot of them, more than 400 people attending and you really, really play the game. So it was really fantastic. I want also to thank our keynote speakers so they accepted to prepare in a very short time their speech and to deliver it in not that easy conditions. Also, thanks for all the presenters in the, se in the sessions and thanks to the, uh, to the chairs and to the moderator. And most of all, I want to address my warm thanks to our tremendous dream team. First of all, the ERSA office with Maristela Angozzi and Nurul Barrio who prepared the Congress, who organized it a long time ago and who devoted a lot of effort to them. So I really want to thank them really warmly and also to Eric Valdener for the communication, for the tremendous communication on social media during the Congress. And also, I want to thank the URAC team, which have helped us and support us before the Congress and also during the Congress and all along the event, and especially Andrea Omizolo, Anna Sidaganel, and Irina Yokon, who were there all the time to support and to help us. So thank you very much for all of you. And now we have to go to another part of this closing ceremony, and that's the air surprise. So Evelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, André, for giving me the floor and, and also for giving me the opportunity um, to, uh, um, to tell more about the air surprise. So dear all, thank you very much for joining from for wherever you are. Also because, like the other sessions the past three days, this is a very special session. The Eurosurprise has the aim to recognize outstanding regional scientists that are active in Europe. It's about awarding scientists that are at the forefront of regional science, of persons that lead us the way and set an example in terms of quality of research, their contribution to society, and very important as well, their contribution to our regional science community. Apart from that great honor and recognition, the prize also comes with a check of 5,000 euros. The committee of the ERSA prize exists of a renowned regional scientist with a good network within our society. Four of them are based in Europe, Aura Rajani, Rachel Franklin, Michaela Beckman, and myself. Three others, Jeff Ewings, Eduardo Haddad, and Arthur Grimes, are representing other parts of the world. The jury is independent and try to be as objective as possible. As each year, the jury members jointly composed a shortlist, which this year consisted of five persons, three women and two men. We evaluated the shortlist of scholars on three main criteria, scientific contribution, contribution to society and policy, 
and contribution to the regional science community, giving the first criteria a 50% and the other two 25% weights. Each committee member graded the five persons on a 10 point scale, which finally resulted in one renowned prize winner. And surely this year's prize winner is very well known. She is active in our regional science community in all sorts of ways. She gave several keynotes, organized numerous special sessions and meetings, and she has always been involved in important committees, both within ERSA and RSAI. And she acted as editor of two of our flagship journals, the Journal of Regional Science and Papers in Regional Science. She is also praised as being an example and mentor for young scientists, and not only because of her enthusiasm and tireless efforts, but more importantly, for her impressive research skills. Her research interests lie in the fields of regional and urban economics, demography, labor economics, and economics of education. She has co-authored over 80 academic publications dealing with a wide range of topics, including migration, human capital, labor markets, creativity, local innovation, and growth. Her articles have appeared in high quality journals such as Oxford Economics Papers, Cambridge Journal of Economics, Feminist Economics, Regional Studies, Papers in Regional Science, Journal of Regional Science, and the Journal of Economic Geography. In 2007, she received the Moss Meadow Memorial Medal by the British Scenario Section for the best paper published in the year 2006. More recently, in 2015, she received the Jeff Jeffrey Ewings Award by the North American Regional Science Council for outstanding research contribution by a young scholar in the field of regional science. In a recent ranking of the top 100 regional scientists of the world, she was ranked 19. Of course, I'm talking about no one else but Professor Alessandra Vecchian. And like I said, I'm very honored and happy to virtually hand over the Ursae Prize 2020 to our great colleague and friend on behalf of the whole committee. We are very happy that she managed to create a keynote at a very short notice. So Alessandra, I'm very happy to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Thank you. I mean, I'm really grateful to all the committee. I was ready to mention all the names myself, but you did it already. So I won't repeat them, but I'm really, really grateful to all these people. And it's for me a great honor, of course, to be the, awarded this uh, prize this year. I'm not going to start sharing my screen, so you should be able to see the presentation. All right. Okay, so as Evelyn said, it was a great honor for me to, to win this prize. It was also a, a huge, immensely huge surprise that came right at the beginning of my holidays. I'm not complaining, very happy, but of course, uh, uh, the, the bittersweet part of this was that I spent a part of my holidays trying to uh, come up with a, a keynote that made sense. And uh, not because everybody's talking about COVID, uh, uh, but because actually I spent the last few months thinking about this, like all of you, a lot, I decided to offer some kind of reflection on what I think I've learned and what I thought about in, in the last few uh, months. So the keynote, the, the title of my keynote is Resilience in Inner Areas, is COVID-19 an Opportunity or a Threat? Some Preliminary Reflections. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, right, so uh, I actually asked a couple of my collaborators to look at my talk uh, before uh, I presented it to you today, you know, just to, to be reassured that what I was going to say was comprehensible and, and nice. Um, and the funny thing was that one of my collaborators told me, oh, you put the thank you slide in the wrong place, actually. You, you didn't put it at the end, you put it as the first slide in your talk. It was done in, intentionally because uh, I really did want to thank not only the committee, of course, I've already done that, but also the very many people that sent me congratulations and uh, all the appreciation and love that I felt in the last couple of weeks. It was really overwhelming and it was coming from all the different parts of the world. I even counted the countries and put flags on my Facebook. Um, so this was a way to try and reach out to all the people that sent the congratulations and really thank you in all the different languages that I don't know all of them. So I just decided to, uh, this is for all of you. Thank you very much. And before I start, 
The title of our talk is about resilience. Uh, I don't want to start talking about resilience again. You probably heard me giving uh, talks about resilience uh, uh, several times already. So the resilience is not the, the main core of my talk. But before I start, I just wanted to have a one slide digression on why I'm using resilience. Uh, the term is resilience has been widely used, but also widely criticized, especially in the field of regional economics. Um, and the people that criticize it are rightly so, pointing out, okay, so what's different from uh, growth or competitiveness or development? Well, I actually believe that the, the really key difference is not so much theoretical, uh, but more linked to the fact that when you talk about resilience, you always have in the back of your mind uh, some kind of external shock. So the resilience is the ability of bouncing back uh, originally, it was the, the, the uh, you see the, the stress ball that it's in there, is the ability to return to the previous state if you look at the physical sciences, but then it has been adapted in economics and regional economics, and it's not just the ability of going back to the status quo, so to bounce back, but also to bounce forward. This idea that a system that is struck by an external shock can handle these exceptional, not normal circumstances as uh, an opportunity to move to a different state, you know, the concept of evolutionary um, uh, resilience and so on. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with it. Um, and then, of course, COVID-19 struck in February. Uh, in Italy, we know that very well because we were the first one that were struck so uh, badly and it was uh, a real shock. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I, I, it's not a correct uh, terminology, but sometimes you would hear me saying that the COVID was the mother of all shocks because it really was exogenous. So it, the, the recession, the Great Recession, was also a, a shock, but in a sense, it was uh, the fault of the system itself. It was brewing within the system. Uh, you can say that COVID-19 is also due to human behavior, but it's definitely, it, it was a surprise and it really felt like something from the outside that hit us on the head. And it was really, truly global. So here at the GSSI, we do a lot of research on natural disasters, especially earthquakes, because we are in a very seismic area. Uh, but normally, these uh, natural disasters uh, are more localized. There are exceptions, of course. You can think of the Isla Icelandic volcano. I'm not even trying to say the name because it's impossible, you know, that for a period blocked completely the air traffic. But uh, even in these uh, very peculiar cases, normally natural disasters are more localized. Uh, there is no country that has not been hit by COVID-19 recently. So it was really truly global and that's why it's a pandemic and not a, an epidemic. And so it was incredibly disruptive. Uh, and so the, the I like this, uh, I don't know, probably you've all read the editorial that appeared in regional studies recently. I only cited the first author, which is David Bailey, but of course all the other editors, or editors were also uh, co-authors. And I like uh, this sentence that they, they write uh, because it kind of motivates the reason why I think resilience is the appropriate concept to use in the case of the COVID-19. Uh, the condition shaping resilience during and after the financial crisis were similar in many ways to the factor seen at driving regional growth and competitiveness in ordinary times. The current crisis, however, will undoubtedly result in some long-standing changes. So the factors that were clear advantages in the past, uh, they mention agglomeration or disability, possibility of unplanned interaction, might operate differently in the context of the aftermath of COVID-19. So it's really something absolutely uh, exceptional. And so uh, with uh, um, Andrea Asca, sorry. Uh, so saying that, how did I get the idea of this uh, talk? Okay, so the idea of this talk uh, came because starting in March, uh, I was interacting with journalists and the media a, a lot more than what I normally do. It was really uh, kind of crazy. And I think it's because everybody was at home and they were uh, looking for, you know, uh, economists or people that could talk about the crisis. And so uh, 
uh, suddenly the, the interviews uh, multiplied uh, and, and I got to interact with, with the media uh, a lot uh, in this period. And the question that they were asking me more often was, do you think that because of COVID-19, now people will move more to peripheral areas. They were asking me this question because they know this is what I'm uh, studying uh, now, which is peripheral areas and the resilience of this peripheral area. And uh, there were a lot of people uh, that were actually saying that, uh, especially in Italy, I have to say, that they were saying that the COVID-19 was a real opportunity for the future of peripheral areas. Now, unfortunately, some of these newspaper cuts are in Italian, uh, bar one, which is the one uh, on the left. Uh, but there is a very famous architect uh, uh, in Italy, which is called Stefano Boeri. And uh, <clears throat> basically the title of this article says, away from the cities, in the Borg, in the small uh, peripheral areas, in the small cities, uh, it's our future. This is just an example. Or the one at the bottom says, inner areas uh, in time of coronavirus uh, from problem, problem to uh, safety. Or uh, uh, the, the other one, it's uh, uh, does the restart uh, uh, go through the inner areas, the opportunities uh, after the epidemics. So in Italy, it looked like everybody was uh, uh, thinking that because of COVID, uh, suddenly, out of the blue, the peripheries will become very attractive and all the urban uh, people would move to these areas. But this is not a trivial question. So when they were asking me this, uh, expecting an answer from me, since I'm studying peripheral areas, saying, yeah, sure, you know, they will move to peripheral areas, I was actually disappointing them because my answer was always, well, this is not a question I can answer. And certainly I cannot answer in two minutes because it's a non-trivial question. Uh, it's a non-trivial question. So there are many factors that you have to consider. And to be honest, uh, back then, but even now, we don't know yet whether COVID will be more centrifugal or centripetal. So we don't really know whether it will result in a, uh, in, in a game in which the peripheries are winning or the peripheries are actually losing. Uh, the question of centrifugal and centripetal forces is of course not a new one. And it's funny because I, I guess that uh, uh, being in an institute where I'm surrounded by physicists, now uh, centrifugal and centripetal came to mind uh, quicker than say pull or pull, fact, uh, pull or push factor. You know, I've studied migration for a long time and yet uh, now I'm talking like the physicists. But uh, aside from that, um, many uh, people actually, they've not called these forces centripetal or centrifugal, but they were talking about the same thing. So when we talk about, uh, aside from migration, but also development, growth, resilience, competitiveness of peripheral areas, we implicitly refer to these forces. And uh, uh, so far, it looked like centripetal forces were winning because what we were observing was a substantial increase in urbanization and peripheral areas were left behind. So you all know the work uh, by Andres Rodriguez Pose, and then also the subsequent uh, uh, discontent uh, and all the work by uh, Phil McCann uh, in, in recent years. Uh, so it looked like really, you know, there was a relentless march of urbanization, to use a term that was uh, um, uh, coined by uh, Cotella and Vitale Brovoron in one of the very recent articles that they published. And urbanization was increasing. By 2050, seven out of 10 people uh, were um, uh, forecasted to live in urban areas. And in a sense, uh, this urbanization was considered irreversible and desirable because the disadvantages, the downside of increasing concentration and urbanization were seen as minor issues, right? There was so much good in concentrating people in large cities that even if there were some issues, uh, we could cope with them. But since COVID-19, this uh, has been questioned and there, there, are, there is a number of experts that started at least reflecting on the vulnerability of our normal consolidated, they call it, way of living. 
Uh, why? Well, because uh, here is a, a, a working paper that uh, um, I've worked on in, ever since the beginning of the uh, COVID in February with Andrea Scani and Sandro Montresor. We did find, at least for the case of Italy, a strong and positive association between the geography of COVID, uh, as we called it, and the economic base of Italian provinces, where the economic base was a measure of provincial specialization in geographically concentrated sectors. Okay, uh, and so density has become an issue rather than uh, uh, an advantage. And in fact, uh, Rune Fidjar also uh, claimed it by saying that density and connectedness of urban areas, which once was viewed as a key economic strength, now appear as, uh, as a weakness. And in fact, I like this, uh, this uh, uh, sentence that says distancing is the new mantra, which is true. We all talk about social distancing now. The same uh, is said, but again, by David Bailey and co-authors in their editorial when they are actually saying that the idea of dense cities as virtues, a virtuous form of social and economic order was central before, right? Has always been central in regional studies and regional science because this idea of repeated face-to-face -face con contacts was always key, was always central. It was superior to any other way of sharing knowledge, including, of course, the way we are doing it today, which is... Uh, uh, this uh, virtual way of, of uh, exchanging information. But COVID-19 has challenged this logic. Probably none of us would have ever thought of sitting here in an ERSA conference totally, completely virtual with hundreds of people. I've never thought of winning the ERSA prize, uh, let alone winning it uh, uh, in this <laughs> situation, which is you know, a virtual uh, ERSA 2020, uh, 2020 prize. Uh, so obviously, uh, it was a surprise. We didn't think that it was possible, but uh, apparently it is. Uh, that doesn't mean that before COVID-19, uh, uh, there weren't people that uh, were saying or claiming that this urbanization uh, was maybe a bit too much and there was a need for place sensitive policies to try and help the peripheries. And again, if you have been to NARSC or if you have been to, to other uh, conferences which have done other keynotes, I often talk about the, um, this example, which is the Italian National Strategies for Inner Areas, as a, a, a systematic way in which a national government is trying to find a solution for the problem of the peripheries. Uh, I'm not claiming it's a perfect solution. I always also say that there are, of course, things that can be improved, but it's a good start point at least to reflect and to raise awareness of the peripheral areas issue. So now the real question in, in Italy at least, but in general even in the world, is is COVID-19 helping or hampering the relaunch of the peripheries? Uh, okay, so uh, I'm not a, a big fan of these Google searches and whatever, but I have put this in here because I wanted to show you something that I found very uh, interesting but also strange because I didn't expect it. I did Google COVID-19 and peripheral areas in English to start with and I got about 182,000 entries. Uh, I've done it on August 21st, so very recently. I did the same thing in, in Italian and I Googled COVID-19 and uh, are internal, inner areas, because the debate in Italy uh, was using actually this terminology, and I got 732,000 entries. And so I learned a few things from this. First of all, a lot already has been said on the relationship between COVID-19 and the peripheries. It's not something new, everybody's talking about this right now. As all the fast growing research topics, uh, I can assure you, you can find everything and the opposite of everything. We also uh, made my job of trying and give a keynote on the topic uh, challenging because really I could find anything I want but also the opposite of anything I wanted. Uh, and then also I've learned that in Italy the topic is perceived of, as being particularly important, right? Normally you find the opposite. If you Google something in English, you get a lot more entries than if you do it in Italian because everybody's using English and only the Italians are using Italian as a language. But this was not the case. So yes, I might have a bias in perceiving this topic as being particularly important because I'm Italian, because here the debate is all on this topic. 
So there are two phases of COVID. Uh, here I'll try to summarize some of the most recurrent arguments. Uh, so uh, among the factors that have been seen as opportunities for the peripheries, so what I call centrifugal forces, uh, of course, density and agglomeration favors the contagion. We know we have seen the work also with Andrea and Sandro. And also linked to that, uh, there are also contribution in environmental economics that link pollution to the diffusion of the coronavirus. Housing market, well, if people spend more time at home, and we did have a lockdown in Italy, they might prefer larger houses so that they can set an office to work and so on, but also they like outdoor space. I have to tell you, uh, I'm absolutely average and normal because the first thing I thought when I had to lock down myself in the house for 70 days, as it happened in Italy, the first thing I was missing was a garden. I so wish for some kind of outdoor space, which I didn't have. So this is pretty normal. Uh, and also, people start in, uh, thinking a little bit more uh, in general about these natural amenities, this quality of light factor, right? That there were a lot of uh, mobility restriction. And so being close to the mountain, and so it happens that I am close to the mountains or the seaside or whatever was perceived as being a good thing because even if you had to stay within your region, you could go to the sea, you could go to the mountains. Um, and the same, uh, tra this translated also in this idea that uh, uh, proximity tourism in less crowded places, uh, the mountains uh, rather than the sea was actually perceived as an opportunity for these inner areas, uh, for these peripheries. And of course, uh, uh, working from home. Uh, so working from home makes the peripheries more appealing uh, because either you don't go in at all, or even if you have to go in to work, uh, the fact that you have to go less frequently makes uh, commuting for longer distance is more acceptable, so you are more likely to uh, live a, a little bit further away from the center and, and enjoy a better quality of life. But of course, uh, there are also challenges for the peripheries, the centripetal forces. The first, and you know, a lot of people have already, I'm sure, mentioned this even during this ERSA conference, is the digital divide. And it's not just the supply, so having uh, the, the broadband uh, in, in the place, but also it's a human capital a digital divide because believe me, in these small places uh, around where I'm living, which are full of quite old uh, people, even if you give them the broadband, they wouldn't know what to do with it. They can't serve the internet. They don't know what Google is. So you also have to fill this gap, not to let these people behind in the process of development. So peripheries are not equipped for teleworking. But also, and more, most importantly, there is a lack of essential services. Uh, uh, first and foremost, health and education are not good in, these, uh, in the peripheries. The peripheries are also weaker economic systems, so they are a lot more likely to suffer from the upcoming economic downturn. So, you know, the number of companies and businesses filing for bankruptcy, there are a lot more small and medium enterprises in the peripheries, which are probably going to be the most affected. Um, and also, as working from home is an opportunity for the peripheries, it might also be an opportunity for the cities, because if uh, uh, it does happen that you don't have to go and commute every day, then there will, have, there, there will be an effect on the traffic, right? Uh, so you might have to spend less traffic commuting every day uh, and so it might become more appealing to live in, in the city and also the cities at least in Italy but I know also in other parts of the world they are moving towards more sustainable means of transportation now I'm talking to, to people that of course live in the uh, in the Netherlands and this doesn't surprise them but in Italy uh, going by bike to work is not very common but it's becoming more common or positive. Okay, so all these points have been raised at some point by different people. And in my mind, I was thinking, okay, can I actually make some order in the different issues? And how can I actually not classify them, but at least trying to put them into some kind of mental order? And so I decided that basically you can divide them in short term versus long term uh, quest issues, but also some are more related to the individual behavior, so they're more on the demand side, while other 
uh, are more linked to the local economy, so they're more on the supply side. So on the uh, short-term individual behavior, there is definitely a window of opportunity for the peripheries because we have all um, uh, listened to the, uh, the idea of proximity tourism and you know people working from home and, and so on. On the supply side in the short term, the key issue is how to allow the businesses to survive. And this is everywhere, in the cities, in the peripheries, you know, linked to this uh, is the idea of how we rebuild the supply chains and what kind of incentive subsidies we actually give to companies so that they don't have to fire people and so we sustain employment. And then there is the supply, but over a long term, <clears throat> after we manage, if we manage, to make the most businesses survive, uh, still in the peripheries, there are structural challenges that need to be addressed because they will still be there even after the COVID. And so if we don't take the COVID as an opportunity to try and change structural elements in the peripheries, uh, things are always going to be the same. And so here is where the digital divide comes in or the essential services or the idea of looking at the relationship and the substitution effects between the working from home and the face-to-face -face issue. But I left this last um, quadrant um, with, with question mark because to me at least, maybe because uh, I'm really interested in the behavior of people, the most challenging thing to forecast is the demand in the long term. So the COVID has changed our preferences. I'm an economist. I always think about individual preferences. Preferences have changed and I think they've changed for good. What I don't know is how much of these preferences have changed for good. And, and is this going to be, you know, a centripetal or a centrifugal force uh, after all? Very briefly, I give you some example of the, the three quadrant that I showed first, because I want to focus then on the behavior. Uh, and I know I've already spent 20 minutes and 40 is my maximum. So in the window of opportunities, of course, uh, uh, an example in Italy, it's this proximity tourism. So uh, while during the lockdown, of course, uh, the tourism industry was suffering a lot. Um, after the lockdown, uh, Italians uh, did decide to listen to the government, to the government, what the government was saying, and also what the uh, tourism sector, Italian tourism sector was saying. And 93% of all Italians stayed in Italy for their holidays. And 25% of them, so one in four, didn't even move from their own region. So if you were in Abruzzo, you were going to the mountains. If you were to well, Marca, you were going to the seaside, but you were staying within your region. And, uh, but also, not only they stayed within the, the, the Italian territory, but they picked less obvious destination. Italians go to the seaside normally over the summer. Uh, the mountains are popular but not nearly as popular as they became this year. Everybody was, you know, trying to avoid crowds. This, uh, this mantra, uh, as uh, Rune Fischer was, was um, saying before, of this distance, this social distancing, had the effect of actually creating crowds in unexpected places. So the picture that you see uh, at, the, at the top is actually the Gran Sasso Mountains, right? Believe me, I live here. I've never seen a mountain this crowded. This is the top and everybody was there. It looks like a motorway, it's so many people there, right? Um, aside from the social distancing and avoiding the crowd, I think that people were also searching for something unknown. So Abruzzo is not well known for, which is the region where I live, is not well known to be a, a touristic region, right? There is tourism, but not nearly as much. A lot of people kind of, especially Italian, uh, don't think of Abruzzo as the first destination to go on holidays. Believe me, this year it was impossible. So it was like, oh, where do we go? Oh, what we don't know in Italy. Oh, we don't know Abruzzo, well, let's go there. And it, it's unbelievable the amount of tourist that, tourism that we had uh, this year. And thank God so in a sense, you know, but really um, it was surprising. The second example is the, uh, the short-term supply. And, and again, I give you another example um, in, in the term of business failure in Italy. Um, in March, this uh, Cerved rating agency published a report stating that 10% of all the Italian businesses were at risk of default, especially in key sector, textile, tourist, manufacturing. 
that seemed bad enough. Uh, but then in July, Istat estimated that about 38.8% of Italian businesses were at risk. And of course, this was almost 30% of total employment, over 22% of the GDP, a, a catastrophe. Um, but it, the risk increased, especially for the small, medium-sized enterprises. So if you look at the micro-businesses, 40% of them are at risk of closing. The large businesses is still 20%, which is a lot, but it's, it goes down with the size of the businesses, which is something that we all expect. And of course, the most hit sectors are tourism, food, catering, entertainment, but also indirectly, of course, commerce and manufacturing. So the wine industry was suffering here in the region where I am because the restaurants were closed. Uh, there aren't, as of today, basically, detailed studies on the special distribution of the impact of COVID on businesses, right? Uh, what we know, it's uh, from this, uh, um, uh, again, a report by Served, that at least in Italy, unfortunately, because I live there, the, uh, the center is forecasted to be the most affected. And it makes sense because if you know a little bit of Italy and the third Italy, so the center, which is made of a lot of small, medium-sized enterprises, uh, these are probably going to be the most affected. Uh, let's go to the structural problem, to the peripheries. So even if we assume that we can sort out uh, the uh, short-term supply uh, problem, right? And, and, you know, all this behavior will go back to normal because it's just a blip in a trend. Uh, I believe that COVID has changed the economy for good. And so now the digital divide, it's a key thing to tackle in peripheral areas. In this map, uh, which comes from a paper with Alessandra De Renzis and Julia, Julia Urs, who were studying these in, in inner areas, uh, you can actually see the, the digital divide in Italy for all the municipalities. Uh, the darker is uh, the shade, the higher is the digital divide. So this is the percentage of people that have either no connection or a very slow internet connection. Now, I don't know if you know the geography of Italy, but if you don't know the geography of Italy, in the second map, I just uh, removed all the areas that were not peripheral, and I colored only the inner areas. And as you can see, pretty much, the dark colors are in peripheral areas. So we do need to tackle this issue. Another example I told you before is the lack of essential services. So in areas in Italy, which are the one in green and especially the very dark green, the ultra remote and remote areas, these are areas that are away at least 40 minutes for remote areas, if not 75 minutes, if you are ultra remote, from an exhaustive range of secondary schools, at least a first level DEA hospital. It means that this hospital can do transfusions or has emergency care, uh, this kind of services, and at least a silver type railway station. It looks a little bit like the, the airline uh, uh, um, loyalty card, right? We have uh, uh, silver, gold, and so on type of railway station. And let's say that silver type railway station is a medium sized railway station. So as you can see, there are a lot of these uh, uh, areas which are away from these essential services. So it's paramount to provide these uh, places with essential services because how can we think, like, you know, Boeri said that our future is in the Borghi, in these remote areas. How can we think if living in this area is difficult for people that were born there and are really struggling to live there, how can we think that uh, urban dwellers will want, want to go and live in these rural peripheral areas if they don't have these services? I mean, it's, it's really difficult. And so saying that in the peripheries there are opportunity does not mean that we have to forget about place-sensitive policies. In fact, it means that if there is a window of opportunity now, we have to work seriously, more seriously on these place, policy sen uh, place sensitive policies to make this place appealing to maybe some of the urban uh, dwellers, uh, not just for a short break to go up in the mountains, uh, but for living. And then, of course, I told you that already, I left this quadrant last because to me it's the most interesting. How much of what we are experiencing now is here to stay? How much did COVID change our preferences? We were forced into doing what we are doing. We were forced to do the air sound line. No, none of us wanted to do that. It's much more fun to interact face to face. But are we going to retain some of what we learned for the future? 
I believe so, and I believe because I, I believe so because I've looked into the the habit and behavior change, right? And I think now it has been long enough that some of these uh, has changed for good. But also, it's like some of these opportunity we were not even aware of them. There has been an, an unveiling of new opportunities, and in a sense, uh, because we you know we are economists we can think of this as expanding our choice set. When we were choosing among different options, maybe teleworking, working from home uh, was not an opportunity. Now it has become an opportunity for some, some, not all. I'm not gonna talk about income levels and differences. This is a whole different talk, but for some of us at least, it's an opportunity. This is a picture that shows uh, how uncommon was uh, um, working from home uh, before COVID, but we we'll see in a second that this is not the case anymore. So, okay, uh, habit and behavior change. This is a fascinating topic. And I think that as a regional economist, I do need to um, connect with other disciplines to understand it better. First of all, psychology, but also now I'm working with some behavioral economists. Uh, there is one behavioral economist, Adriana Pinate, which is now in my group, and it's fascinating what they do. Uh, I thought that they had a better idea of how uh, a habit forms and how long it takes. Uh, it turns out that they don't. In fact, there is this article, which is a review article, uh, that was published in 2020, in which the, the authors point out that research on habit formation, it's still in its infancy. So I don't know, but they don't know either. Um, and uh, this uh, famous article that is cited by several uh, social psychologists by Lali et al. in 2010, uh, they did several experiments, you know, they, they can take people and, and do experiments to find out how the behavior changed. They find out that it takes between 18 to 259 days for a person to form a new habit. The range is massive, I agree with you, but the average is 66 days. Uh, there is a myth on the internet, if you look at this kind of website, that 21 days is enough to change a habit. Well, it's not based on academic research. What the academic research says is this, 66 on average, but with a huge range, right? But uh, it struck me that the lockdown in Italy lasted 70 days exactly, from March 9th to March 18th. So if we believe that 66 days is the average, it's long enough that some of us will have formed a habit on certain things. And there has been changes in consumption, housing preference, and so, and so on. So how did consumption uh, change? We don't know very much. I found this very illuminating graphic on Facebook, which I really like because I think it's the state of the art of what we know about consumption change in, uh, in, in behavior uh, right now. Joking aside, um, spending patterns were not universal and different countries at different priorities. In Italy, the biggest increase was in flour and then gloves and the biggest drop in makeup and perfume. In fact, here is the graph. Uh, Italians seem to, uh, in March, we were really concerned about how to make video calls. None of us knew how to use Zoom or whatever. So that was our, you know, uh, first concern. Then we all started baking bread. And it's funny, I did the same. I didn't know that all the Italians were doing the same. I'm really Italian too. So we were all baking bread. So that's explained flowers and yeast. It was impossible to find. And then as we were making bread, we probably realized that our hair were growing longer. So we all start having the problem of how we uh, do a haircut or how we dye our hair because, you know, they're, they're uh, gray and, and so on. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, maybe I should move there because the biggest increase was in ice cream, water and wine, which I appreciated. In Germany, the biggest increase was in cleaning wipes and soft drinks. And this really makes me uh, laugh a little bit. Um, and I'm glad I moved from the US because in the US, and you probably have all seen the news, the biggest increase was in toilet paper. In fact, on March 12, the sales were up 734% compared to the same day in 2019. Aside from this panic phase in which, you know, shopping behavior was erratic, cross-country differences and so on, I think that there are now, in the living with the virus phase, uh, there are some consumption patterns that might be more revealing of the long-term trend and real habit formation. For instance, cleanliness and eye hygiene have become a major preoccupation. So maybe now you want to be in a place where you have a good hospital, if that's the, same, if that's the case that might make you stick to you know, more central uh, areas. 
there is a huge fear of uncertainty, right? We know that the economic crisis is coming. Everybody's telling us this is going to be much bigger than the previous one. So what we all do, I did the same, you postpone non-essential purchases. And also linked to this, is now the environment seen as an essential or not an essential good? Because short-sighted people might not care about the uh, environment in, in, you know, if they have to save. And there's been an increase in savings uh, very quickly. You can see this, the saving rate went up everywhere. Consumption went down in Italy, especially went down quite a bit. Uh, online shopping increased. And also these uh, might be a centrifugal force because if you can get everything online, you don't need to be close to whatever, a large supermarket. And then this effect of cocooning. So we spent more time at home and not just for work, but also for awareness and entertainment, you know, Netflix, uh, instead of going to a cinema or, uh, or whatever, we, we, we have now the, the treadmill in the house, a small one instead of going to the gym. So if that's the case, again, this might be centrifugal because if you have your own, uh, in terms of like a cinema at home using Netflix, you don't need to go to theaters anymore. And so you don't need this kind of of, you know, agglomeration uh, economies. Uh, but not only preferences in terms of, you know, consumption, but also in terms of housing. And this is my last point. I'm almost done. I'm very aware of the time. Um, this is linked to cocooning, so the housing. Um, this has been debated a lot because this is central to this define whether the peripheries will grow or not. Um, a lot of people are saying, okay, so if you want to stay home more, you want a better house, so you invest more in the house. So are these changing in housing preferences uh, permanent and implying relocation processes or not? Again, there are a lot of different reports online. These actually, uh, it's a report for the UK, not Italy, with 1,300 respondent, respondent. And not surprisingly, uh, if you compare what they were uh, looking for pre-COVID and post-COVID, there has been a huge increase in the demand for personal outdoor space, everybody wants a garden like me, and also private workspace. I don't have an office here. In fact, I'm doing this keynote in, on my kitchen table, but I would like to have an office, and so with a lot of people. So these are uh, things to think about. The expansion of choice set, well, two things only. I'm going to talk about uh, very briefly, working from home is the new normal. So just look at the red one here. Pre-COVID, 42% never work from home. Uh, now, they are asked what they are planning to do in the next two years, and only 3% are saying that they will never work from home. So huge increase. Now, this is an opportunity. Uh, it's a part of your choice that you can choose in most cases to work from home at least part of the week. But also, and this uh, really is affecting a lot of us, GCSI is a small doctoral school, so not so much us, but the large universities uh, in, in the north, uh, especially, are suffering from this uh, fact that now it's, um, it's available to the students the possibility to attend university online, to do the online courses, right? So uh, uh, this is an article that came out on the newspaper uh, uh, two days ago, and it showed that uh, compared to previous years, in these towns, which are university towns, there is a lot more availability of rental accommodation. But it's a huge uh, increase. In Milan, it's 290% more than last year. In Bologna, another huge university town, 270. Padua, again, very famous for the university, 180 and so on. So this is going to distort the housing market as well. The fact that now a lot of people can be at home, most of them in the South. And then uh, this is, for instance, uh, the, um, these are uh, some of the biggest universities in Italy. And you can see the percentage of students coming from outside the region. For the University of Bologna, 40, over 40% 40 of people come from outside the region of Bologna. And here you can even see the catchment area in the first uh, um, graphic on, on the left. You know, they come from all these places. And on the right, uh, just in the honor of my very good friends of the Polytechnic of Milan, I did the same in the I've showed the catchment area of the Politecnico of Milan, which also has about 30% of students that come from outside the region of the university. So, okay. So what is the take home message? Okay, so very difficult to, uh, I haven't talked about inequalities, I haven't talked about income levels, I haven't talked a lot about a lot of things because you know, there's so much out there, but everybody's studying and talking about COVID-19. So if you wanna do some serious research on this, be uh, prepared to read 
a lot of material. A lot is not good, a lot is good. But everybody is talking about COVID. Everybody's applying for funding on this topic. It's, it's unbelievable. Everybody's focusing on this. Uh, this is something really unprecedented. So I would be really skeptical of articles, and I've seen quite a few, that take the 2009 crisis and then they say, oh, we learned from that and now we're telling you what's gonna happen with the COVID. Mm, I think the preferences are really different now. I don't think we're going back to normal. Up until a month ago or so, I, I was listening to keynote and, and uh, speeches of people that were saying, you know, we are at the edge. We might go back to normal. I think we are past the, the tipping point. We're not going back to normal. And that is also true. Fabiano Compagnucci, who also works with me, uh, pointed out in one of his articles that epidemics are also becoming more frequent. So even if this goes away, now people are more aware of this. It's a little bit like terrorism attacks. Before the Twin Towers, nobody was thinking about that. Now we know it's a possibility. This made the possibility of epidemics real. So people will adjust for good. Uh, we are seeing a lot of patterns, but still a lot of uncertainty. The final outcome, I think it's very uncertain, will depend on the combination of the centripetal and centrifugal forces. However, I would say it's important to avoid simplistic answer. Cities will not die. I believe some face-to-face -face contact will always be important, but also as Krugman recently wrote in one of these articles in, in the newspaper, we have to actually look at how much of the substitutability there will be, because probably the COVID will you know, make some of this face-to-face -face contact substitutable. And the less frequent commuting means longer commuting is, is more appealing. Uh, there are opportunity for peripheral areas, but only to those who can grab them and provide appropriate infrastructure and services. The other will not benefit. And so I reiterate the need for place-based sensitive, uh, place sensitive policies. And last but not least, and I'm done. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra, for this um, brilliant, very broad and comprehensive uh, speech about the COVID, the COVID when you put the stress on the exceptional character of this crisis, which is in any sense repetition of a 2009 one, and also thanks to open uh, new ways. So there are a lot of questions, but I will abuse of my position, and I will start with one question of mine, <laughs> to be sure to have time to ask it. Um, in, the, in, the, in the past year, uh, there were a, a, a lot of denunciations about uh, very urban areas and also urban, urban sprawl because there was a tendency to reconcentrate and to go to the cities and so on. And you perfectly explained that it's not possible to come back to rural areas, especially at that time. But don't you think that maybe there could be an opportunity for a revenge of very urban areas of this kind of place when there are gardens, as you stated, not far away from the city, a bit far, but if you have only to go two or three times a week, there with two to work, maybe you can accept to travel a bit more, and then you are a bit more social uh, distancing. So maybe we will we'll start a new wave of uh, urban sprawl in the peripheries. Yes, I agree with you. So I, I do believe that there is an opportunity. I do believe uh, that some people, uh, I mean, this is just anecdotal evidence, but my parents, so, so it happens that they are um, uh, selling houses, you know, they, they are intermediaries. And uh, now what they're observing is uh, a lot more uh, request for houses that are, as you say, at the fringe of the urban areas, right? So not really in areas, not really peripheral, but they want a garden. So they move a little bit far away from the center. The center is not as appealing as it was before. Um, prices are actually at the moment lower, but then even these, we'll have to see, right? If there is a higher demand, maybe these houses in the periphery will become more appealing. There will be also an increase in prices in the long term, who knows? Uh, but no, I totally agree that there, we, there is an opportunity for these places, maybe intermediate, right? Where you can have the best of both worlds. But what I was gonna say is that uh, 
at least in the case of Italy, this architect is actually claiming for these uh, quite distant uh, remote areas to become the next place where people are moving. And I think that they don't really, they underestimate uh, the, the preferences of individuals because living in these very peripheral areas is not easy and the lack of services, which is still there, and so it needs to be tackled. If we do that, then I really believe that the COVID can, can be a tipping point. But we can't just sit here and say, the COVID is changing things and we don't do anything about it. No, the COVID is helping us help ourselves. First, we do these things. We keep on doing what we're doing, essential services, digital divide, all these. And now, so to speak, the COVID came to give us a hand if it makes sense, right? That it's, it's still not easy. Okay, thank you very much. There are a lot of questions, so I will start to, to, to cope with them and to ask them because we have some time, so we have time to respond. Um, so the first question is about uh, the impact of um, the COVID on gentrification. Mm -hmm. and the question is, uh, may COVID mean an opportunity for traditional city center residents to reclaim their space. Um, in that case, cover may have to come to rescue cities. Okay, so uh, I can't give an answer which is definite or that will apply to all the countries because gentrification in the US, it's different than gentrification in Italy, of course. The city center in the US, which is virtually inexistent. Uh, it's one thing. In, uh, if I think about the Italian cities, it's a completely different thing. Um, I think that the COVID is, I don't think it's an opportunity for the city centers. I think that the city centers will probably keep the businesses there for sure. Well, not, maybe not all of them, but in terms of residential, um, again, anecdotal evidence though, because I don't have the data, but from what I hear and I heard in the last few months, a lot of my friends want to move out of the city center need to actually intervene possibly who knows if the if the it becomes a real issue a real problem yes now they're talking about new york will new york die i don't know i don't think new york will die honestly uh i was reading this debate richard Freud also thinks that new york will not die i mean some people love Richard Florida, some people don't like Richard Florida, so who knows, but in this respect, I kind of agreed with him that I don't think New York is going to die, really. So let's see. At the moment, I don't see a need to really be so worried about the city centers. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, I, maybe it's my bias in worrying more about peripheral areas because I live in one. Well, related to peripheral areas, there is also a question about uh, third places or co-working places, mm -hmm. those kind of places. Do you think they can increase? And also the, the, another question which is related to the idea that a part of those places could be located in peripheral or uh, rural areas as, as well, so it could help. So I, I read an article by Ilaria Mariotti of the Polytechnic of Milan, which was on co-working uh, spaces. Uh, it, there was so much to say, I, I couldn't put it in my, in, there are so many articles that I read and I didn't put in the, in the talk, which was already too long. Um, but yes, I, I saw that uh, uh, even here in L'Aquila, before the COVID, that co-working was becoming more popular. And, uh, uh, well, who knows? Co-working co in small groups, <laughs> in the sense that now this distance is becoming an issue. But if you decide to co-work with uh, some of your friends and whatever, that could be a way of creating some critical mass in peripheral areas. In L'Aquila, it was becoming quite popular. And they haven't closed the co-working spaces in L'Aquila. They are not worried about you know, uh, working together. They take turns and maybe, you know, they're friends and so they're not worried. And we are sending back the kids to school. So at some point we will have to, to go back into having contacts. So I think this is an interesting uh, topic to study and see what's going to happen. But to create, create critical mass, I think co-working in peripheral areas is a good uh, viable option. Okay, thank you. There is also a very long question about... Um, uh, ICTs and mm. the use of ICTs. If I can try to, to, to resume it, that's a, a, 
about the idea that uh, maybe ICTs can help to live this new life and maybe ICTs when they develop can uh, allow to, to live a bit at a distance. And, but also we know that there are a lot of also, also of opposition related to ICTs as we see the opposition to 5G at that moment as well. But it's quite uh, um, geopolitical. Okay, so L'Aquila is one of the Italian cities which is in the experiment of 5G. So I'm very well aware of all the people that are skeptical about the 5Gs and they say, you know, it, it gives you cancer and it's dangerous and whatever. But that didn't stop L'Aquila from getting the 5G. And to be honest, at least here, the opposition was really a minority. I don't think that the majority of people are actually worried about this starting from, from this. In terms of I, the role of ICT, of course, it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, and this is what I was trying to say. So it's a matter of uh, having uh, the, the appropriate uh, supply technology in place, but also, and I can't stress this point enough, uh, uh, I think that what it's really lacking is human capital, digital human capital. In, in these peripheral areas around here, in their inner areas, especially with the national strategy and so on, they have put in place the broadband and you know, all the, the facilities. A lot of these places now have it. And maybe they use it for like tourism and hotels and stuff like that. But the, the old lady cannot do the online shopping or cannot go and do the things like, you know, I don't know if it's the same in other parts of the world, but since COVID came, we could actually have our uh, medical uh, prescriptions online with a barcode and whatever. So we didn't need to go to the doctor. We could download them and then we would go and get the medicine in the pharmacy. You need the son or the grandson of the, of the old people to do this for them. And if they're lucky enough, then they can do it fine. Otherwise, they are left behind. It's the people, not the places that are left behind. So yes, ICT, yes, but let's not forget not everybody knows how to use Zoom. My dad doesn't. <laughs> Okay, there is a question also about um, the question of milieu and um, especially of the difference you make uh, between a need and a habit with the idea that uh, the um, new state as, uh, as a milieu, as an element of the individual utility function and um, the way that to work, uh, you need an office and it's natural and so on. And mm -hmm. how this COVID will affect the behavior uh, regarding to the milieu in which you, you, like, you live? Uh, yes, it will affect it. I, it. It's not clear to me if this person means that the people will still like uh, this, uh, this, this living, working together with other people, or if they are now starting getting so used uh, of doing it in isolation that they don't care about going back and do it in groups. It's both, but milieu in a sense that you need to be integrated with other people as well. All right, and, and I totally agree on that. I, I, I'm very glad of doing this keynote, but I would have preferred 1,000 times doing it in a physical environment rather than doing it online. And I'm sure you, we kind of all share this, right? Uh, going to conference is a different experience than do, uh, do it online. So there is something to be said about, as you call it, or as the, the person that asked the question called it, this, uh, this milieu. Uh, ah, and here, uh, now I can see it. What is the difference between need and habit? Uh, okay, uh, very good question. So it's true, we were forced into this, so it became a need. But uh, are we sure that uh, some of, I don't dislike doing some of the things online. It saves me time. I've worked three times more in the last few months, but I've also been 10 times more productive. Now one can say, okay, but your quality of life went down. It's all true. But I'm just saying that for certain thing, it was a need at the beginning. It became almost a habit now. For others, it will never do the jump between need and habit. Doing a conference like Ersa, it's a need, not a habit. I will never get used to it. 
it's a great, it was organizing, you know, I'm not saying that you didn't do the perfect job, but it's not like a physical one. So for conferences, probably this jump between it and habit, it's going to be very tough. But for other things, right, for doing like uh, examinations, doctoral examination or uh, well, it's not ideal, but you can do it. Or um, selection for places, like we, we select our students uh, online this year, right? Because they couldn't, that worked out pretty well. So there are certain things that probably will become a habit. Uh, there is also a very interesting, but probably very difficult question that I ask it. And it's about the, the the way to come back to normality and the pressure of the, the governments to restore normality in the day-to-day -day relations. Mm -hmm. I can a testimony that it's not only the governments. For example, in my uh, office now, we have to ask to stay home in advance. So beforehand, as I'm a researcher, I didn't have to ask. Mm -hmm. And now I have to, I'm supposed to ask to the director of an institute if I want to, to stay one day home. So that's a kind of new pressure to normality or, mm -hmm. or even to come back or maybe to come back uh, uh, even stronger than before to normality. I know that's not easy. Uh, I'm, I'm reading the question as well. I, I did manage to open the chat. Um... I'm not underestimating the, the fact that some governments, some parts of the governments, uh, some governments more than others will want to go back to normality. I'm not so sure that uh, all the governments uh, or all the parties want to go back to normality or, I don't know, I, uh, there, there might be a pressure, of course, because normality, the status quo is always kind of our comfort zone, right? So going back to the comfort zone seems appealing. Um, and I don't know if this question comes from Italy or not, but I don't get this sense in Italy that there is a rush to go back to normality and it's a need for the government to go back to normality. Um, yeah, it, it creates some problems for sure. You know, distortion in the housing market, the fact that now if you don't teach students, uh, the local economy suffers because you cannot rent out apartments to the students. This is a huge problem. So there will be some groups that will put pressure to the government uh, to go back and teach not online, but in, in presence. Uh, there will always be exception like that. But I don't think... Honestly, I don't think we will go back absolutely to normality, even if the governments want to push for that. Okay, I've, thank you very much, um, Alessandra. I will. I have one of one other question, which is not uh, that easy as well, and it's related to the, the question of um, environment and uh, climate change and so on. So a lot of people said that maybe in the future there could be a second or a third wave of environmental wave and be even bigger uh, than now. So you claim, uh, in you, and I completely agree that, that um, in this uh, pandemic we started to prepare for other pandemics and we changed our minds related to that. Mm -hmm. You think that we learned something about uh, the maybe future climate change or bigger pushes related to environmental disease? I think that there will be two types of people. So the people that are uh, more aware of the long term and that are a little bit more rational and that they can afford it will start caring about the environment more. But my worry is this. Um, if you are struggling to survive, and right now you get a product which is not environmental friendly but cost less right and you are not among the fortunate one you are short-sighted you look more at your own uh, well-being survival you know you maybe lost your job there is an economic crisis that is coming would you think about the long-term environmental perspective or be rather short-sighted and think, well, I do have to survive, this costs less, uh, I don't care about the environment. And so I'm worried about this second type of, uh, of behavior. 
uh, in an economic crisis. Because to me, you need to be a little bit forward looking, right? To, to, be, to be able to take the environmental problem in your stride. If you're not forward looking, uh, it's a common good. Environment is a common good. So why not overusing it? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra, for your speech. And congratulations for this uh, air surprise. It's really well deserved and you, you prove it. You, thank you, you, you. Thank you very much. Completely. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thank you very much. And now uh, we have to go to the last part of the closing ceremony. Um, hopefully next year we'll come back, not maybe to normality, but maybe to hopefully to uh, um, a face to face meeting and um, the, the 2020 Bolsano ERSA Congress has been postponed. So the organizers have kindly accepted to postpone it and also to organize the next one in 2021. So uh, now we will, I will turn to them and I will open the floor for them for the presentation of the next 2021 Congress of Bolsano. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please let me join you thanking Maristella, Nurul, Eric from ERSA office, and also my colleagues, Anna and Irina, for the great job. It was, uh, it was a, green, a great honor to help you in the, organizing, uh, uh, in the organization of this first European web conference that now is coming to the end. It was a pity that we could not meet you all in person in Bolzano. We were ready, but due to the pandemic <laughs> and in agreement with the, the presidents of ERSA and ISRE, we decided to give priority to your and our uh, safety. COVID-19 permitting, we are confident that uh, we will be able to host you next year in, in our beautiful city in the heart of the Alps. The short video I will show you now uh, will give you a brief impression for a, a next year Congress. Uh, take a look and uh, see you next August in Bolzano. Dear colleagues, Bolzano Bozen is a small city in a small but autonomous province in the heart of the Alps at crossroads of populations, languages and cultures. URAC Research and the Free University of Bolzano Bozen are pleased to welcome you to an exciting scientific meeting. We are expecting fruitful discussions and great results. I think the main topic for this year's Congress is very exciting. We want to focus on the discussion on territorial futures in a changing Europe. The Congress will be an opportunity to discuss significant megatrends affecting Europe's society and territories. The most important messages will be launched by our keynote speakers and then the challenge will be yours. We're looking forward to meeting you and your contributions. We are very happy and proud to host the European Regional Science Community. The program we are working on is full of key lectures and parallel sessions, but also really interesting technical tours and social events. This will allow colleagues coming from Bolzano to exchange experiences, meet friends, and why not, even consider new research and joint projects. We are organizing the Congress as a green event because we would like it to be as environmentally friendly as possible. And therefore, one important point is to offer you products from the region. The main venue is located in the city center, which is very close to the central train station and therefore easily reachable by walk. For further information, please check out our Congress website and our social media. If you are here, do not forget to take some time to visit the Dolomites, the Iceman and the cultural highlights of our wonderful country. See you in August in South Tyrol.
thanks again, uh, dear president, for this opportunity. And <laughs> see you next August, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, if the, the pandemic uh, uh, has to, uh, to, to host you. So thank you very much. Many thanks uh, for everybody. And uh, now uh, we want you to put uh, the August 21 ERSA Congress in Bolzano on your agenda. So we cross fingers. And if uh, everything is OK, we'll be there together next year, all together, to enjoy face-to-face -face meeting, to enjoy conferences and people. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks for this great conference. And see you next year in Bolzano. Bye bye. Ah, ok, bon, on va fermer ici. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fini?